Okay, um, we're going to begin this, and this is a session that will go from 7 to 7.25, and I'll give Vinod a two-minute uh, sort of heads up. Um, Vinod's going to be uh, is on the faculty of Dixie State University in um, St. George, Utah, and has been very active in Simeon and very supportive. And it was his idea that we ran the Scutum using videos, and we've gotten some amazing student videos. Uh, so uh, he's agreed to talk about his work with uh, student ownership and engagement um, and how interdisciplinary collaboration can help on that. So Vinod, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, uh, thank you Brian, and uh, thank you all for being here. I know it's like an evening, right? So being at seven o'clock in Eastern time. Okay. The I don't know. There was some. Can you advance it? There is, there is some. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. And I can see your video. Can you advance to the next screen? OK, one minute. There is a confusion here. There is a video feedback I'm getting. I don't know where it is. I'm so sorry um, about that. We're thin on help. There is. You are is you a, getting it? Is that a talk something going on or? Um, uh, yeah, there are five talks going on. Do you have an echo when I speak? Yeah, I think I'm hearing another person presenting. Okay. Um, Can you guys hear that or only me hearing that? I don't hear another person presenting, so. Okay, um, okay now I'm not hearing. Okay, someone must have heard us complaining. Okay, all right. Because you, I think the Sokoko software was there. That's the reason, sorry. Okay, I'm doing all it. Right. So go to your screen sharing. All right. Okay. And give it I'm a full screen. There you go. Okay. I'm right. sorry about that. Okay. No, so, you don't have to be sorry. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you all for being here. It's the evening uh, in the Eastern time. It's seven o'clock. Uh, I know Yamping is in uh, uh, Pacific time. She's lucky a little bit. I'm in mountain time. So just before I start the talk, I would like to really uh, say where I'm from because there is something really good right there, right? It's a, from Dixie State University, St. George, Utah. It's soon to be Utah Tech University uh, starting uh, this July 1st. And uh, most importantly, for this is specific to this particular talk, uh, it is an open access university. That means we accept everybody. Uh, so that really makes a big deal compared to other schools. And uh, I would like to start with the question for the start. Why students need to be exposed to interdisciplinary collaborations? So that's the first thing I want to say how to do it, right? So we got around uh, 10 people here. I'm thinking we can take at least two to three minutes uh, uh, to just talk about it and then reconvene and say report and say what what's what, what it is. And then we can go from there. I'm gonna put everybody in breakout room for two minutes and then we'll come back and report for a minute. If that is okay. The question is just why students need to be exposed to interdisciplinary collaborations? Why we need to step out of our mathematics? Uh, why we need to collaborate outside our field? So I'm gonna just make uh, three breakout rooms So, what are the thoughts? Anybody want to share why we need international collaborations? Anybody? Anyone? I think in, in, in our room, I think everybody agreed that it was a good idea, a great idea, um, but there's institutional problems that make it a very difficult idea to implement. Yes, I totally agree. Anybody else from other group? Our group felt like uh, life is interdisciplinary, so it's good to teach students interdisciplinary things. Yes, yes, bingo. That's great. Uh, anybody, anything else? 
from any of the discussions? I, I think that if you go to work in industry, you're working on projects and those projects have, you know, you probably have somebody from economics, marketing, you probably have someone from the chemistry department and you're the statistician and, you know, you've got to learn their vocabulary and you got to learn to work with people from other disciplines. Um, Absolutely. All those are exactly, I put in the slide, which was great. So we're all thinking on the same lines. <laughs> so that is wonderful, right? We need to get this hands-on experience for the students, first of all, because uh, most of the time, if we don't get this hands-on experience, the students lose interest on in the subject material itself. Math is beautiful, but we got to cope with something else to get it to the nice part. And also, Nobody's going to say in real life, the employers are not going to say, hey, go to chapter five and do number five. I'll give you $5,000. So they got us, the employers are actually looking for someone to use the skill set they learned from the class, classroom setting to use it in solving a real and complex real world problem, right? Uh, so, and another thing is, we, we all as mathematicians, we appreciate mathematics. Mathematics is cool. All those things are amazing. But from student perspective, who is starting, uh, who is not like a math major or even a math major at the level of first like a sophomore year or a freshman or sophomore year, they they we, we cannot expect the same thing. So we got to do something to get them excited about mathematics. So this collaboration, collaborative projects could make them, oh, math is wonderful. Math is beautiful. Math is cool. All those things. And most importantly, just like from the conversations in the, in the job market right now, it's very competitive. They need to have this skill sets, writing, presentations, and teamwork. All this could happen with this interdisciplinary, not one person. Mathematicians are not going to work only with mathematicians. They have to interact with everybody in the team. So this is very important. That's the reason for why this is needed. And thank you for doing that breakout activity and then getting that. And I want to talk about how it started for me. It just started for me through MAA PIC Math program. And just to briefly to say what is a PIC Math program, if you do not know, uh, the fac faculty member actually teaches a class where we get a real world problem from a business industry, a nonprofit government organization. Uh, mostly it will be like, there'll be like large amount of data these industries have it, but they do not really know how to use it or make use of it to make an informed decision making. So that's the PIC math program actually led mostly, again, this is not just data problem alone, but whatever I worked on the problems for the previous past three years, I worked on really data problems using mathematical modeling. And this actually helped them students in the resume to stand out in the job market, they can always refer to this kind of programs, this kind of projects saying, I have worked on this projects and employers are really looking into this kind of things in their uh, interview skills and all those things. And that absolutely is supported by NSF. So I wanna start, I wanna give a essence of what I have done with my students with a couple of projects here. Uh, one of the project I worked, um, my students, this is just coming directly from my students' slides. I just want to keep the, their slides so that I can give the credit to them. So this is a teamwork who did prediction model for Zion National Park. And people coming to Zion National Park is increasing every year. Like it's, it's crazy, it's, it's really increasing. So we need to find an optimal way to provide some good experience for the visitors. In that way, they are, if they're planning a trip for one day or two day, they don't want to spend two hours spending, uh, spending time to find a parking spot in the park. So they can rather spend that valuable two hours going out in the park and have a great time with the family and enjoy the beauty of the nature. So in this, the idea is to develop a model to predict the number of hikers. Uh, and then the park data provided a sample data set of the Zion National Park entrance activity. The goal was to develop an algorithm to predict the number of hikers on specific trials based on park entrance data. So this will actually help the Zion National Park administration in so many different ways. 
uh, because this can help to plan and allocate resources uh, more effectively. Right now, they have like they they don't have that much money, or they don't have uh, a basic way of using the data set they collect and efficiently uh, manage the park resources. And uh, this can also protect the visitors and natural beauty because if you think about one trail, there is thousand people in within an hour and the trail can do wonderful only for hundred people, then there is a problem. It, it, it creates lots of stress and frustrations. People, people are visiting just to get things out of it, right? So what students did was they took a data set just to give a sample data set that's right there. We got data sets for five different trials. Angel's Landing is the favorite oh. one out of all those. And people really come all around the world to get that thing. And this is the one data for May 14th. You're seeing it on the screen right there. And uh, for every hour, the number of people is provided for sample. This is a sample data set. And that's a daily measure of activity. And what my students did was the students used a sliding window algorithm from a research paper. The algorithm is originally used to predict weather patterns. But if you think about it, weather is almost like plays a big role whether you're visiting a park or not. My, my students took the sliding window algorithm, which was used to predict weather and applied it to the visitation data because visitation is also affected by the weather. So this is, for example, 2019, we have data until May 13, and suppose we need to predict for May 14. What my students did was they got the data set of 2018 and uh, compared it with all those different windows of seven days and took an average and whichever is closely resembling to the previous year, that was that the 2018 data set. And they took a difference from all this equilibrium distance difference. And then they took an average of this two and went back and added it to the previous day to predict it. And this seems to be a very simple mathematics. Yes, it is. That's the whole point. We don't want to make it too complicated sometimes. Sometimes simple models work better too. So that gives 99% accurate, but again, this is a student slide. You guys know we need to make it out as for one day. It's not one day, it's okay, but we need to see it for average, right? So students actually did that for throughout the hourly thing and then took an average. You can see easily the actual unpredicted uh, thing. It, it's not really that much, but this is better than nothing. This can help the park to say, okay, there is this many people are gonna be there in this particular trial during this time. So let's plan accordingly. Shuttle services to that trial. Can we direct optimizing the shuttle path? Is that okay? How many uh, ranges need to be there around this time? So those kind of things is better. So, and then they did for all the trials and they got this result and uh, it was really very cool. And uh, right now the parks data is trying to adapt this algorithm to put it in their system. They already got a mission learning algorithm uh, with the pictures of all the cars algorithm. So they're using, they're trying to use this method to get some sort of uh, an app or those kind of things. So they're trying to do it. So which is fantastic. And the students who did this was uh, three students. One is a math major and the uh, other person was a computer science major. Uh, another one was uh, information science major. So these are all like three different majors. They come together and solve this problem because everybody had their individual strength and they learn from each other. That was a cool thing. And another project, I'm not gonna go in detail of it, but I'm just gonna tell you what it is. So. This is the project which we did in spring 2019. All these projects are pro sponsored by PicMath program. And uh, if you notice that uh, there are three students involved in this project, Chandler Young is a computer science major, Ray Shilliot is a finance major, and Anthony is a math major. 
So this, this was thrown out. Again, when we started this project, nobody knows there's a solution or not. That's the cool, cool thing about it. I do not know there's a solution. The students and we work together and I try to say whether they're going, going in the right direction or not, providing the resources. So they come up with the creative activities of this. And the goal is the local transmission company provided us the data for all the customers' data with uh, like uh, age, uh, gender, and uh, type of car, and uh, how much miles, and how much they have spent on that, uh, the dam, the transmission problems. So the goal is to create a filter tool where you just use the information which you can get from the starting point. Like, okay, what is the gender? What type of car? And what is that? I can, I can show you. This is what the students came up with the web application for the company and which is actually getting in the name, gender, zip code and make and model miles. And it will tell you whether it's a high end or low end or medium end customer so that the, the transmission company can use that information to better assign a salesperson or a better service. So that really increase, that will increase the revenue and also they, they know where to allocate resources and how to do it. So that's one thing. So now those are the two examples uh, of the project I did with interdisciplinary collaborations. So why are these experiences significant? We talked about it. We said why students need to be involved. Now, why are these significant experience, experience significant? One is, math students or any student in our classroom, students are really shy to ask questions, right? So it, this will actually force them because they need to deliver the product. The, it will force them to ask questions. And uh, so asking questions, and then it will help them to be a good team player. And they have to communicate the results in such a way to a layman audience because the industry people sometimes are not a math person or a, they, we need to really, we cannot talk about like high phase stuff of mathematics, like, okay, anything like probability distribution, all those things. We got to deliver it in such a way they can understand it. So that is the skill what this 21st century is looking for. So those are the skills very important right now. So that's the reason why this type of collaborative work is important in our curriculum. And of course, there are challenges with this while we do this, for example, when we did a breakout session, you guys, you guys told like, okay, hey, uh, depending on the institution limit, how, how to do this, right? But I'm from an open access school. So I got lots of different levels of mathematical maturity within my classrooms. So we could do it in any, any level. It's all about, it takes some time, but it also, getting everybody excited. For example, the industrial partner, the students and us and then administration to get excited and buy into the project. If we could do that, then this would be a little bit easier. And also putting together a team based on the skill set of whether the communications or programming, all those things. Every team should have a programmer. Otherwise it's gonna be harder. Even though they can formulate the problem in mathematics, it's harder for them to actually execute it. So you should, we should find, we should distribute, we, we cannot have two programmers on one, one team, then they will fight, right? No, it's not that. So they, they, may, they may probably, that's not an optimal thing to do. And one thing I've noticed is whenever I do this class, whenever I teach this class, the students actually, after the first, one, first week, they come to my office and say, you know, I don't think this is my class. I don't think this, this is what I wanna do. Uh, I'll ask, okay, what, what happened? Then they'll say, no, because, it's a little bit frustrating because I, I, don't know, I don't know where to go. I understand completely because they are not used to this kind of courses. So they are not comfortable because they are used to going to lectures and coming and doing homework problems and living happy life, right? So this is a little bit different. So, th so we need to really help them to see, motivate them, okay, fine. What is the problem? Let's go slowly. Let's, let's talk to the team and get things done. And also receiving the feedback from the industrial sponsors is also difficult in the sense like you need to plan that in before the beginning of the semester, like every, like every three weeks, every two weeks, 
the industrial sponsors should come. Mathematically, some of the results may be reasonable, but in the industrial perspective, it may not be reasonable. So we need to talk about that. So I know I got six more minutes. I need to go and get this thing done. So what is the biggest reward for me? I have really seen my students going grow, growth mindset for my students. They all went through frustrating moments or I felt they didn't go through the moments, they grow through those moments, so which was great. And uh, this helped uh, particularly to get a cross-disciplinary collaboration within my university. After I was doing all these projects, now I, I got involved this year, I got involved with a City Alliance program where I was, I was asked to be sitting on the committee and then now I'm working with St. George City Police and then we're going to work with other cities throughout the, uh, across the university. So which is a great experience. And now I'm trying to involve more students. If this doesn't, if I didn't do this, I don't think I would have got all those opportunities to create the curriculum and create hands on curriculum. And action items is always good before we leave, right? So if it is really too much to do this, I would say start with SCUDEM, start with MCM. So this can help to put together a collaborative work that can help to see how students are working. Then that can help for you to talk to the community members and get things rolling. And this is one of the sample problem. You can see that is from the 2018 ICM problem. And uh, I will just, uh, stop here but before that i want to say praise the process rather than the solution failures are okay embrace failures because this the water if you want to do this students are going to fail it's okay and if we don't put them in uncomfortable situation within a constrained classroom they're going to go do a biggest blunder in the real life setting so it's always it's okay so thank you for attention i'm okay thank you well, we got a little time before Eric starts. Um, any questions or contributions or uh, issues? How, how do you get started building a team uh, for even the PIC project? They assign them for you regionally, is that it? Or? Uh, no, uh, so once you get selected for a PIC math program, you have a summer faculty workshop after that, you come to the university and they provide resources out to contact the industry people around. Okay. So for me, uh, our dean was very active in the local community. Okay. So I, I, I got some connections. I reached out to them. Then that's how it started. Okay. So you didn't go through like an engineering department to find engineering projects. You did it more globally than that, right? Yes. Okay. I reached okay. out to the local partners and then they, they are so excited. And the most, most importantly, what I have seen when I was talking to them was they do not know what to do with the data. Uh, they, they're thinking, okay, all mathematicians can help. So they do not know. So okay. that's where it, it's always better to go and ask them, okay, hey, how we can help. In that way, they will say the problems, what they're facing, then we will come back and formulate that in the mathematics. Okay. All right. Any other? Issues, questions? I want to thank Vinod for uh, sharing that with us and uh, wish him well in the future projects because uh, the, the thing about failure is absolutely true. I mean, uh, some of our best students haven't experienced the failure and it's best that they understand how to deal with that. We don't go in intentionally, but um, that's just the way life is. So. Okay, thank you again. And I'm glad they're changing the name of your school and you seem to be proud about that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. All right.